it's not necessarily failure. And which is like, so many people say like, oh, failure um, does. Cause like, no, you're gonna fail. I, I failed a, a million times. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you actually get to that. And, and, and so many people have said that, and it really is. It's um, not making a difference. Got it. You know, is, you know, at the end of the day, when you, when you look at everything you've done, it's like, did I actually make a difference? So that's what scares me. It's like, looking at like, did I actually, you know, like, and, and not making a difference in that. So uh, because I love teaching, it's my passion and I love getting that out there, that that scares you, you know, like, hey, you don't want to make sure uh, that I make that difference. And it doesn't have to be on a global scale, but in that one person's life, did I make a difference in that life? Welcome to the Imani Experience Podcast. In this podcast, you will experience wisdom, advice, and stories from creatives all over the world. Your host is Amani Roberts, who is a DJ, music producer, professor, avid book reader, and developing salsa dancer. On the show, we love to share the stories of creative professionals, especially people who have gone from the corporate life to the creative life. Once again, Welcome to the Amani Experience Podcast. Welcome to episode 29 of the Amani Experience Podcast. For this show, we have Anthony Eisenhower from Brood 9 in the studio. My favorite two things about this episode is that Anthony has a really interesting life. He's done a lot of things, diverse work experience, acting experience. So it's great to hear him tell stories about that. And then I really love towards the end of the episode, when we talk about boxing and combat sports and just the state of the industry. I enjoyed our conversation about that as well. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to read you a review we have from C Wu 001. And they say Amani is great at interviewing his guests. He has good follow up questions to get to know the person really well. I take away action items that I can apply to my own life every episode. Thank you very much for that review. Please remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a review. We appreciate all the support. And we'll get to the show. Thank you very much for listening. Welcome back to the show. I'm going to read our guest's bio for today, and then we'll get to the show. Our guest today has over 25 years of experience studying, practicing, and teaching martial arts. Our guest studied gymnastics at L.A. Valley College and dance at Loyola Marymount University with the purpose of increasing flexibility and endurance for competition. He competed as an amateur and pro in Muay Thai, ISKA kickboxing, pancration, and MMA. He also performed stunt and fight choreography for music videos, commercials, and various film and te television projects. Past projects include Alias, Birds of Prey, Dark Angel, and Power Rangers in Space. He did all the stunts for the Blue Power Ranger. I'd like to welcome Anthony Eisenhower to the Amani Experience Podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. We are very happy to have you here. And I'm going to go back. And can you list the different types of martial arts that you teach and know? Because it's a pretty extensive <laughs> list here. Uh, thanks. I mean, uh, martial arts has been my passion for so many years. And so and, and not just kind of focusing on one, I really just want to learn everything. So it all started, I mean, we can even add in wrestling on there. You know, I, I did wrestling, Taekwondo, uh, Kenpo Karate, uh, Gung Fu, uh, Muay Thai, uh, Dutch style kickboxing, pancreation, Jiu Jitsu, Japanese Jiu Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, I mean, there's probably a capoeira. I so yeah. many just uh, styles uh, <laughs> as well. I, I I loved just learning as many as I could, and um, and still even to this day I still love learning from whoever I can. And you know uh, I, I figure you can always learn something new. Okay, and you studied gymnastics at L.A. Valley College and dance as well. And you said you used to be part of a dance group, or what was with the story I, uh, there? <laughs> I was. Uh, dance was another one of uh, kind of like those back in uh, passions I always have. And um, I, uh, I danced for a very long time, you know, throughout uh, junior high, high school. And then we, when I had uh, moved down here, and um, so I uh, just kind of started studying it as well. Um, I just was, you know, just dancing at like clubs or um, even doing like promo dancing and things for uh, stuff. And then I uh, actually minored in it at Loyola Marymount University because I, uh, I uh, met uh, just this amazing group called Metropolis Dance Theater, and they're a professional dance company, and I uh, decided, yeah, why not? Why, why don't I try this? And they, they loved what I could do, and so I cool. um, did that for like seven years. And what's your preferred genre of dance? I'd say either uh, modern, contemporary, or hip-hop. Great. Okay. 
and we we were a little ahead of ourselves. We usually do a geographic check in for the <laughs> yeah. for the interview. Where are we right now? Uh, we are inside of uh, my gym, uh, Brew Nine Martial Arts, here in Lamita, California, um, where we do uh, MMA, fitness, uh, Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai. Um, personal training, a little bit of everything. So Nice. Inside the gym. I love it. Great yeah, environment so. for an interview. And where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Aberdeen, Washington. Well, I, I like to say Aberdeen, Washington, but technically I was born there. There's a little tiny town right next to Aberdeen called Cosmopolis, okay. which is a population 1600. Um, so that's actually where I, I grew up as a little kid. And then um, high school and junior high and everything was in Aberdeen, which is, I guess, the bigger town next to it. <laughs> Still about a population 16,000. All right. So Pacific Northwest. Yeah. And then you came down here to Loyola Marymount. Why did you decide to attend Loyola Marymount? So that was actually even later. Okay. I did that. So I, uh, I graduated high school. Um, I stayed up there for about another year um, going to school at Grace Harbor Community College and then Evergreen State College and just hated it i mean i i I hated life up there i was going nowhere wasn't doing anything i was i was competing i was doing things and then my family is actually from here and um, so i had family down here and my uh one of my sisters had already moved down and we talked about me moving down but it's just one of those i don't know and then her boyfriend at the time um, was an accountant at beverly hills he actually offered me a job so if i moved down and so I just kind of done. done. Um, I didn't know. I mean, at the time, I, I, I didn't even have an inkling of where I wanted to go to school, anything like that. I just wanted to get out of where I was. I mean, see, so I just kind of made the jump and uh, never looked back. Great. OK, well, so then after Loyola Marymount, you started, you know, your work career. You were at a couple places, Quick Star Security. You worked for LMU, actually, the university, correct? I did. And that's, that's actually why I uh, ended up graduating from there as well, um, is through working there um, and everything. Because I, I basically did uh, college when I could. So um, came from, you know, we didn't, my family didn't have a lot of money. We, we, we were poor and everything. So I, I pretty much had to pay everything myself for college and everything. So we actually started at like community colleges and everything too, until finally when I got the job at Loyola, when I could actually transfer into there Good. and um, end up doing school there. So I worked at a lot of different kind of companies. Yeah. yeah. Um, Red Bull the, as Red well. Bull. Yeah. Nice. Red Bull was the last uh, corporate, I'd say, uh, if you could call it corporate, but it is a um, <laughs> uh, place I actually worked for. Good. And then st- even before, while you were in school, you started Brood 9 as well, yeah. like back in 2009. And like the theme of the show here is we love to talk to people who used to work in corporate America yeah. and then decided to take the leap and kind of pursue their own creative ventures. You definitely did that. It's, it's a different, a very unique, and I love it. Yeah. So tell us, first of all, how did you balance between going to LMU, working, starting your gym in 2009? Like you were triple tasking, as we were talking about before. Like yeah. how did that work and take us kind of to current day? Um, sure. I mean, I, uh, I was trying to finish out, uh, school while still, um, working full time, but then, um, I was also training and getting back into competition. I had just finished, um, the dance company I was in, uh, they kind of like uh, broke up because people moved and everything too. And so I, uh, was teaching on the side, just kind of out of my garage oh, okay. and everything too, just, you know, the, here and there. And then, um, I'd always wanted to. And it was actually through, um, at that time, she was my best friend. She's actually my girlfriend now. Um, uh, Marlene, she actually um, knew how much I wanted to teach and everything, too, and found a place, um, Abrigo Martial Arts, uh, which was looking to rent space, like if people wanted to like rent space. And so found that for me. And I decided to kind of do that. I'm like, all right, let me, let me do that. <laughs> I, I talked to him and I rented space on the weekends. And whenever the basically whenever their classes weren't going on is when I could okay. kind of teach. Got it. And where did the name Brood Nine come from? So that that goes quite a <laughs> quite a bit back. Um, Brood Nine actually was not my inclination. Uh, it was created in '95 in uh, in Washington, or two, by uh, one of my great friends, Hank Woon. Um, at that time, uh, we all were coming from. Uh, I, I'd say like. Broken families, a lot of like just to say, things going on in our lives, I mean, too, that we all kind of grouped together with um, through martial arts, through 
comics, through role playing, through you know everything that now was kind of cool at then was not at all, <laughs> uh, and everything too. But uh, we all kind of found each other, and there happened to be nine of us okay, <laughs> that okay. did. And uh, Hank is a storyteller. He's a writer. And everything too. He's an amazing storyteller. He, he does a lot now with it. And he came up with the name Brood Nine to, to realize that Brood was. Uh, it's actually based more off the insect family. It's a, uh, a group of individuals. Um, uh, like-minded individuals on the same path to a singular goal. And so that's kind of where it came from. He created this and the story behind it. And I loved it so much. It stuck with me. And especially that family environment that, that uh, of always having that singular goal and kind of going for it. So it kind of stuck with me and I uh, wanted to use it maybe later on or in two. And obviously he thought it was great. Yeah. So Very unique story. Good name. <laughs> like it. Now, in the early to mid 2000s, one of my favorite shows on TV was Alias, and you did some work on Alias. <laughs> Tell did. us a little bit about that with Sydney Bristow as her character I name did. was. <laughs> it, it, um, it was great. I mean, it was, we had, I had a lot of fun being able to do it. I actually was working on this um, smaller movie um, called Dream of Al Alvarine. Um, cheesy, not a good movie, <laughs> but I, mean, I had a fun experience. I mean, and I met some amazing people, and I happened to meet one of. Um, uh, Bobby Lento is doing a lot of the uh, fight choreography for um, the uh, for Alias and everything too, and, he, and I was a fan of the show already, and uh, so we had uh, just this great communication, loved and everything too, and so he invited me on the set, and I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd already worked on other ones before then, and so then um, we just kind of hit it off. We introduced me and everybody, and then they just kind of asked me if I want to do some stunts here and there, kind of threw me into things, and. Um, so I got to be able to work on it for a couple seasons, um, nice. doing a lot of background stunts, doing a lot of different uh, things on episodes. I got to help him with some of the different like fight choreography and and um, some of the different like singular scenes to kind of change. I helped him kind of change some of the layouts of what some of the fight scenes were and what they kind of uh, transformed into. Okay. So it was kind of it was really fun. They had some classic fights. I remember when she yeah. found out her roommate was not who she thought he was. That yeah. was like a big scene. Were you around during that time, or um, I was right after that. Okay. So the okay. next season, which was uh, that was season two, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so season three is when I came in. Yes. Um, when all of a sudden it's two years that has gone by. She doesn't know what happened. Everything too. Um. So and um yeah so i gotta work a little bit more on those and nice. then the season three and four on there cool i've been meaning to go back and rewatch the series now i have even more motivation <laughs> so excellent, now excellent. i'm gonna keep a close eye yeah wow great great okay so now we love to kind of talk about just what was it that made you decide back in i think you kind of went full-time in 2014 ish or 2014 2014 why did you decide like okay now's the time to kind of jump all in and go for it with you know your training and your gym um I, a couple different things kind of came up one was um at the time i was still working at red bull and they uh they were they were awesome i mean so great about it we had we had opened this gym so we'd moved out of the other place and opened this one and I was basically working like 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. there and then just coming right Ooh. down from Santa Monica every day to here. And it was it was a lot. I mean, it was a lot of strain and, and you know, especially because there's travel and a lot of things. And then um, things were changing there. So they wanted me to change my hours to like 830 to 530. And so that was kind of an inkling of like, man, I don't know. That's going to be really hard. I have to change things to here. Started getting me in the mindset of do what do I want to do? What's my passion and what do I want to do? So a, a couple of people really helped me with that. Obviously, Marlene was always there for me as well. You know, and hey, whatever my choice is, great. But um, two major people, uh, Scott Nelson, who owns um, OTM Fight Shop, Lucky Gee, Built a Fight. Um, and uh, he'd helped me with so many. He, he was my sponsors and everything too. And he right away was like, hey, just do it. You know, I did it. You can do it. I, I know your skills. I know what you can do. I believe in you. And um, whatever you need, I can help with. Um, the other person was Mark DeGrasse, um, who owned uh, My Mad Methods. He had created My Mad Methods magazine. Um, so many things after that. On, on Academy, he, he helped me began and, and a lot of things. And he, he had helped me with um, creating my first stunt DVD and a lot of things. He had done all that, too. He had made the jump. And, right. And, um, and so I saw these people who were believing in me, backing me, and everything too. Hey, we know you can do it, and everything too, you have that. And I, they had done it. And so I was like, you know, I'd saved up money. And so I was like, why not? Right. If I don't do it now, I'll never do it. And, and, and it was one of those things I'm like, what is my real passion? What do I really want to be doing? 
you know, do I want to be working? I mean, Red Bull is a great company. It's an awesome place. But do I want to just be doing that or actually live my passion? So. Right. Great. And then for those of you who are outside of L.A., to go from Santa Monica to Lomita <laughs> at like 4 o'clock on a normal afternoon, although it might be 22 miles, it's going to take you two, three yeah. hours sometimes if yeah. you're lucky. And so that's brutal. Yeah. The, the minimum time was about an hour and a half. It would take yes. me. That was a, you know, if it, it was under an hour and a half, that was like, wow, we got here quick. <laughs> I don't know what to do with all this time. <laughs> yeah. Usually it was an hour and a half to two hours uh, every day. So, yeah, so that, was, that was a huge investment for you. So yeah. good. If you were to go back to 2014 when you first made the jump mm -hmm. and maybe give yourself a little quick advice, and I'll come back to this question later again, but what would you kind of advise yourself four years ago now that you know what you know? Um, probably put together a little bit better of a plan. <laughs> so I had the passion and I, yeah, I had the money saved up and I had the people believing in me. Um, I didn't really have a plan of how to do it though. So, uh, that, that's, I definitely would say is, you know, as uh, you can have all the passion in your, in your life, you can have the drive, you can have the skill, but if you don't have a plan, it doesn't actually work. Right. And I, and I realized that pretty quick, the plan and then working on some of the skills I didn't really have you know, that I didn't realize he really needed, you know, right. like marketing and sales was a big one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I did not have those right. at all. So that how, did was you, it. how did you acquire those skills? A lot of, a lot of time, a lot of energy, um, in learning. I mean, the, uh, some is, uh, doing courses that I could, um, especially doing, I went to Lord, Lloyd Irvin's out in uh, Florida. He has this uh, martial arts uh, business summit. Okay. He does It's four days long and it's all specific for, um, marketing, sales, everything like that for martial arts. Nice. So, and, um, so Scotty had done that. Scott Nelson, he had done that and everything too. And he pushed me to do it. He's like, you, you needed to go do this. So that helped me a lot. It kind of, a lot of light bulbs went off yeah. during that. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of helped me pursue different areas that I needed to go to. Okay. Uh, so. Yeah. So you had some good mentorship. I did. You invested in yourself, personal development. Um, you know, for me, when I started my business, I came from corporate America and they used to invest in you and send you to classes. I kind of forgot that once yeah. you start your own thing, you need to continue. You have to do it on your own. So you learn the same lesson. Great. What do you think is important for creative professionals such as yourself, myself to succeed in today's business environment? Um, I, you know, I think that's, the number one thing is, is a plan, you know, um, you can succeed. You absolutely can, you know, and, but you can't just have passion alone. You can't have drive alone. You can't have skill alone. You gotta have a plan. Look into what area you want to go into. So whether it's, you know, for, for DJing, whether it's for fitness, whether it's, you know, for painting, whether it's for whatever you want to do creatively, look into that, look into how others did it. You know, especially people who are succeeding. If you are passionate about that area, you probably know the people who succeeded in that area. Right. So go to them. Why not? <laughs> ask them a question. Don't ask them dumb questions. You know, like, <laughs> hey, uh, what, what kind of stuff do you like? No. Ask them how they did it. Right. And, and start putting that together in your plan. A lot of times they'll give you some amazing information. You know, I got that from like Martin Rooney, John Spencer Ellis. I mean, and I just ask these questions of people like, well, how did you do it? You know, and, and started in, in putting together a plan. That's a huge thing. Put together the plan and where you want to be at. Good. You know, most small businesses fail within the first three years of they grow. You're on your fourth year. How, what has happened? How have you been able to continue to thrive and grow throughout your first four years? Um, I haven't. I won't say it was easy. Um, <laughs> it never is. <laughs> never is. But um, I, I think it went from having a broad focus to a narrower focus. When I very first started, and even before, you know, because we actually moved into this location in 2013, and uh, and even before then, my I had a very, you know, huge focus. I mean, I wanted to be this and that and that, and and I started really narrowing the focus down of, and and that really started helping to um, set me aside and, and start growing the business instead of just how good you look to certain things or online or, or on things or how much you can, you know, put out there is, but how much are you investing in your business? Got it. And, and that narrower focus really kind of helped 
make that uh, succeed in Irving too. So. Good. And when you say you narrowed your focus, what like how, what is, how is it now compared to how it was before? So before, I mean, I, I, I did a huge amount of, I mean, and I still do when I can, of you know, writing for other people, um, videos for other people, and like mm -hmm. posting online as much as I can, and, and, you know, doing these, I mean, I still do the magazine articles when I can and things, but I, I was doing so much to get my name out in the world, um, but that wasn't what was actually like in my community. So instead of actually um, putting the name out there, like, hey, great, this guy in um, Scotland knows who I am and likes our stuff. That's awesome. Hey, it's still cool to like. But what does that do for me, actually? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it, I started narrowing the focus to community areas and how can we develop the community here? How can we develop it in the South Bay area and started looking more um, towards here? Got it. And, and kind of narrow the focus on, on, on that instead mm -hmm. of, you know, you know, and it matters what, I guess, business you want. Do you want a global business or do you want a local business? <laughs> right, right. And how do people find out about you and your gym nowadays? Um, I mean, same kind of ways. I mean, um, obviously online, you know, like we have all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, uh, Yelp is, I, I'd say Yelp is probably, love or hate it, it's probably, <laughs> you know, the most thing that people find on though um you know I, i'd say more businesses um hate it than actual people just <laughs> using it but um it is probably the number one place for people to look for an actual business because you know one uh, great thing that um i got told was also it's like facebook is awesome and everything too and you can you can put a lot of money into that but for the most part people don't go to facebook to buy mm -hmm. they go on yelp to right. buy People are directly, they're going on Yelp. That's directly what they are looking for. Right. You know, you may just happen to come on something on Facebook or online or even on your website or things. You could direct into that. But when you go on Yelp, that's what they actually are going to buy. Yeah. So I can only laugh when you say some businesses hate Yelp and love it. I can relate. I understand yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's frustrating. <laughs> right. Um, definitely. <laughs> As a business and everything, too. Yeah. But, you know, it's like it's one of those necessary evils. Definitely. Definitely. When did you realize that this was going to work, your gym was going to be a success, you're going to be able to thrive, and like the turning point to your career, when did you realize like this is going to happen? Um, I, in some ways, I still think it's happening. I, I, it, like, <laughs> you're not there yet? <laughs> you know, I mean, because I, you, you always want a little bit more. And, yes. Um, but uh, I'd say probably about a year or so after... Um, uh, I, I decided to leave Red Bull and everything too is when I kind of looked at my schedule and realized how much it's uh, growing and how much things and you know, at first you're not sure because all you're looking at is how many students do I have how, what, what is my plan for this week what is this and, and, you, and you stop to look at your actual like well what am I actually doing and you kind of realize how busy and how much you know things are taking up with the business and everything too and you're like okay, I guess this is working, <laughs> you know, and it was about a year, year and a half after we kind of did that. And, um, I kind of realized that, that, um, my schedule is really filling up and, you know, I, I'm actually having to turn people away, especially for personal training or things or projects they want me to be part of. Cause I just, I just, you know, don't right. have time. Okay. And then kind of a good segue is why do you love what you do? <laughs> um, I love teaching. Yes. That's, uh, it's, it's weird. It's been a passion of mine almost my entire life. Um, I, I've always wanted to be a teacher. And martial arts became a passion. I mean, at a very, very young age. And for the most part, right when I was in love with martial arts, um, I was like a sponge. I soaked it up quick. I was able to learn it, but not just learn it, but be able to teach it to someone else right away. And I loved that aspect. I loved being able to not just enjoy it myself, but be able to pass it on and, and, and seeing that little spark in someone's when they get it. And, and, and so that's kind of why I love what I do, because I see that on a constant and, and consistent basis. Yeah, I'm the same way in terms of teaching DJ. Like, I love yeah. it um, just seeing people when they can get a certain concept and they learn it and can repeat it. Then that's like gold and I, that fills me up. So I'm the same way. Definitely. What is something that scares you? Um, let's see, I actually wrote that one down. <laughs> That's good. It's, it's, it, it, it's interesting because it's, it's not necessarily failure and which is like, I mean, so many people say like, oh, failure, um, does cause like, no, you're going to fail. I I've failed a, a million times. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you actually get to that. And, and, and so many people have said that, and it really is, 
it's um, not making a difference. Got it. You know, is, you know, at the end of the day, when you, when you look at everything you've done, it's like, did I actually make a difference? That's what scares me. It's like looking at like, did I actually, you know, like, and, and not making a difference in that. So uh, because I love teaching, it's my passion I, and I love getting that out there that that scares you, you know, like, Hey, you don't want to make sure uh, that I make that difference. And it doesn't have to be on a global scale, but in that one person's life, did I make a difference in that life? So okay. now the whole kind of martial arts training, personal training, that industry is very, very crowded. Lots of competition. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How do you rise above all the noise and distinguish yourself from the competition? It's, it's, it's a hard battle all the time. And especially with Instagram, with Snapchat, you know, that, I mean, there's, you know, people post stuff every single day. You can find, uh, something, you know, that people say is like, Hey, this is the best diet. And you know, two things there's not, or this is the best superfood, And this is not. So there's so much information out there that there's too much. And basically it's not getting caught up in all of that and really kind of like focusing on people and focusing on healthy living with them and being very direct, you know, not getting caught up in that and not, I used to be very caught up in like the global stuff. I'm like, no, I got to make sure I put out all this good information. Got to make sure it's like, no, what I got to do is make sure I'm helping people. Don't focus on me, focus on them. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's a huge thing I don't see, especially on social media. It's a lot of singular focus. Selfies are huge, obviously. <laughs> I mean, and we, and you know, we do it with every a group, but is making sure that focus is not on you. Because, you know, I even tell people here, it's like, hey, as cool as I think I am, I'm not necessarily the one that always brings people in. It's everybody else. Right. It's what you did for them. And I mean, too, yeah, hey, look what I did for them. We can do it for you as well. Or look how much fun they're having. Awesome. Good. That's going to do kind of focusing on that more than on yourself, especially in like posts you do or in information you put out there. Um, that definitely has helped you really, again, like, uh, set uh, aside differently than a lot of the others. Okay. You mentioned selfies. We're going to have to get permission to take one later for oh, our absolutely. cartoon, but absolutely. I understand what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> you also, in a previous question, you spoke about failure. Talk mm -hmm. to us about how has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? Oh, man. Um, I mean, there's, there's been a lot. I mean, I, I, I will not deny it. And I mean, too, I'd say, um, what, you know, one of the uh, major turning points in, I'd say, what I was doing with life was in 2003, I, um, I was still competing. I was doing, trying to do stunts. I was working full time. Um, I wasn't teaching yet or anything, too, um, but I was, uh, I, 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 I had no passion in fighting anymore, but I was just doing it because it was something I did. I went to a tournament in Las Vegas. And, um, I mean, I didn't, I did okay. You know, I had, I had three fights, um, but I got beat up. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I, I did okay at it, but I got beat up. And nothing's worse than going to Vegas by yourself, <laughs> driving back by yourself, oh. bruised oh. up, beat up. And like, and you got a lot of time. <laughs> Four you know? or five hours yeah, at so least. You got a lot of time to kind of <laughs> sit and think about stuff. And I realized that time, like, why am I doing this? I don't even enjoy it anymore. I've lost the passion, not for martial arts, but for fighting, I'm not a fighter. And when I, that kind of clicked right there, that, that failure, cause I, I, I didn't, I mean, I did okay out there, but I didn't win. I didn't do it. And, and, and I realized I hadn't been winning that well lately because I, I wasn't, that wasn't me anymore. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't what I, uh, I wanted to be. I didn't want to be a fighter. You know, um, some people do, they, well, they love fighting. They want to be that. That's awesome. I never did. I wanted to be a great martial artist. I wanted to be a great person. I didn't want to be a great fighter. It's just something I did. And, and that kind of failure out there, coming back beat up, bruised up. I mean, you're, I mean, you're already hurting and you got a four or five, <laughs> it was about a five hour drive back. And it's, it, it, you feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's one of the times that it, it kind of clicked right there of like, Hey, I need to change my focus. Right. So then from that experience, that long drive home, once you got <laughs> back five hours later, yeah. what did you change or tweak or how did you make a shift? Um, I basically shifted on completely getting into competition training at all. Wow. I didn't, I didn't uh, even look at competitions anymore. I just stopped it. And I started focusing on other things I realized. I still loved martial arts, so I was still learning it and I was still doing it. But I, I 
regain a passion for dance and I started doing that a lot more and I was doing that at Loyola and with the dance company I'd, I'd actually met them and, and started focusing fully on that I was only learning even martial arts that had nothing to do with competition like I didn't have I didn't I didn't do fighting styles um, you know I was doing more wushu I was doing more uh, capoeira gung fu I was doing more of those kind of styles um, and, and even the gymnastics and everything too to help more of a dance Interesting. than everything too because I just kind of just lost the focus for it. I still love martial arts and the passion, but I, I really just changed my focus completely. Okay. So that kind of shift started a new chapter, so to speak. Yeah. All right. Now, what do you do and how do you handle your critics? That's, it's hard. I mean, um, I, I do a lot differently now than I used to. <laughs> um, I got, I would get so upset, you know, yeah. people didn't like me or didn't things yeah. like that. I, I try and figure out why, or I'd be like blasting back at them <laughs> things. And, and now, I just kind of like rise above the biggest and, and, and people can say rise above. But it's not just, you know, like, Oh, I'm better than, no, it's finding out what's there. What, you know, well, what's going on? You know, like if somebody says like, Oh, you didn't do that video very well. Okay. Well, cool. Dave, no worries. <laughs> um, Thank what you. do you think? What do you think that I can do better? Right. Hey, how would you do it? Do you have a video that shows that? Or Hey, if you're local, well, come on by. Yeah. Let's show it. Start doing that kind of putting it more on them. They have to do the effort. All of a sudden, they they start changing, because then it's like, oops. Okay. All of a sudden, they're like, oh wait, I gotta wait. Uh, well, no, I didn't say that. Or, you know, they start really kind of changing what their uh, their thought process is, and their negativity starts changing as well. Because now, I, a lot of people I, I notice, especially critics online, I mean, too. I don't know why, but they're looking for a fight. <laughs> trolls. Yeah. Internet trolls. You, you know, they're looking for it. So basically, when you kind of put it back on them to have to really make effort, yeah, they, it, they stop. They tap out, yeah, so to speak. they do. <laughs> and so I kind of started doing that a lot more. Okay. Um, and and even, even you know, uh, it happens in person. Oh, you do martial arts every two? Well, I bet I can beat you up. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and? <laughs> and I'm like... I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, well, then come on down. Hey, we got sparring this day. Man, anytime. Free. Okay. Yeah, they never show up. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. All right. Tell us about the darkest time of your life, how you got through that, and what you did What did you learn from that experience? Um, I, mean, I, I would I would be a liar if I didn't say there weren't, weren't quite a bit of those. Right. Um, Especially like a fighter in that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been a lot, and, and, and especially like... There's been a lot of mo emotional strain throughout my life, and I'm into. I mean, um, uh, I've lost both my parents. I've lost a lot of like, people in my life, and everything too. Mm -hmm. And those have been some uh, gradually led to a lot of dark times, and everything too. And um, at one point, I mean, you know, uh, super broke, not you know, like barely being able to pay rent, everything like too, and, and and eat and everything. And um, what what really helped was leaning on people. You know, the, some very specific people really helped you kind of get out of that and kind of helped you be that where it is going to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get over these things and not uh, and, and not holding everything in. You know, there was there's definitely dark times during those, um, you know, specific one, especially um, right after uh, I'd say like before we moved in here, I was still at the other gym and um, I'd left Loyola. Um, I was like, no, I'm going to do this. Well, I, I do this. I don't, you know, other things happened at Loyal and I into and, um, a lot of relationships had broken up everything. I mean, there's, there's, I was barely making rent. I was barely able to really, you know, you're shopping the 99 cent store every two for food yeah. until you can. And, um, I had, uh, Marlene with me. She really helped me and I into and always believed me. And we, we kind of like leaned on each other. And there was that one person that you just, could talk to the whole time and get all these emotions out and figure out. And then all of a sudden you just, you, you start calming down and start leaning on contacts and, and everything too. And, um, it all kind of worked out. I mean, like, I, uh, I'd made so many contacts at Loyola for what I did there. And, um, they started contacting me when I left there, you know, I mean, it was, it was after a while and everything too. And, and, and so I realized that I wasn't alone. Got it in that so all right yeah thanks for sharing yeah who was the most influential person for you growing up uh, um you know i mean i am from the tv and movie generation 
And and to a T, I mean, we we had it on all the time at home. Lots of movies and everything too. My dad is huge into action movies and everything too. And I loved martial art movies. Nice. So I was, I mean, John Claude Van Damme was huge. <laughs> as cheesy as he is, as people <laughs> say, he was a huge ass. I want that, you know, Bruce Lee obviously and everything too, but that was later. Right. John Claude Van Damme, Michael Dudikoff from the American Ninja movies. Um, even Steven Seagal at the time, that made me want to learn martial arts. Interesting. You know, a lot of those. Because I did, I mean, you know, when I was a kid and everything, they, you couldn't jump online and, and be like, cool, look up kickboxing and see thousands <laughs> of videos and see that. Uh, man, you knew kickboxing from Kickboxer, from these movies that are coming out and be like, oh my God, that's amazing. How do they do that? And I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are huge influences on it. Good. Have you had a chance to meet John Claude? I, I haven't. I haven't. Okay. I, I, that I would have been awesome. I, I still one day would love to. Yeah. And everything too. I've I've met um, some other people who I, okay. I looked up to and everything too, but not not John Claude. We'll, we'll put that out there. We're going to play on this. We're going to get, get a little meeting. You know, that, put that, the... uh, that would be amazing. <laughs> now, if we could go and talk to your 21 year old Anthony, where were you when you were 21? Were you? I was down here. You were here. I, I, I had I had already been down here. I moved down here. Um, right before my 20th birthday. Okay. And in so before I turned 20, and so um, at 21, I was I was living actually in Anaheim. Okay. At the time, and I was working at a law firm, and I, I was actually uh, I just finished working on the Power Rangers, I think. No, I was still finishing up, but right. it depends on when. Okay. So um, we're gonna check you out at a, like a Starbucks near Anaheim Stadium, <laughs> near the baseball stadium, and we're gonna give 21 year old Anthony some advice. Nice. What kind of advice would you give yourself? Uh, you know, the biggest advice is just to uh, steer the course. I mean, keep going. It's it's going to work out. I mean, I don't like to look at it and be like, hey, I, you know, oh, don't do this and don't do that and do that. Because I'm going to make those mistakes and I love where I've gotten to here. So I don't want I don't want to change anything. So just steer the course. Keep it going. It's, it's going to work out and you're going to have a blast. Nice. And then what is the one lesson in life that took you the longest to learn? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, um, you know, I mean, probably the, uh, I'd have to say like the lesson in life that kind of took the, is, um, believing in myself is, is one of the things is, you know, saying, believe in yourself or leaning on other people, not, you know, keeping everything in or not trying to do everything yourself, you know? Um, yes. I know I can do that, but there's a lot of other people that can too. And that's been a huge thing is like, you know, delegating people saying in, in, in corporate America, I mean, too. And, and you know, the whole mentality of like, well, I would give them, but I can do it better. Who cares? No, if you want to get to what you're best, you got to have other people yes. lean on them. And, and there's amazing people out there that are willing to help you and willing to get there and, and use them. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, you know, kind of been the one and, and you know, networking is a huge thing and that was a huge thing to, to change up. So, yeah, I, you remind me of a favorite, uh, African proverb that I've shared a couple of times. It says, if you want to go fast to go alone, if you want to go far, go together. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you just said that every great person has a sentence. What is your sentence? My sentence would be, I help people unlock their creativity by teaching them how to DJ. What is your sentence? Um, we, 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 it's not even a sentence. Um, it kind of builds out to a sentence, but it's almost a statement. It's if you want more. Okay. You know, we, we put it out there all the time. If you want more, um, we can help you want that. And you should want more. If you want more out of yourself, out of your body, out of your life. Um, we do that. I do that. That's, that's what I want to show you. And, and it's okay to want more. Good. What is one new habit that you've added to your daily routine in the past year or so that has been most beneficial? Um, I'd say one of the biggest things is actually turning off my phone for at least an hour there in the day. Nice. You know, as much as you, um, as a business, you know, Hey, your phone's kind of there because you need the social media, you need all these things and everything too, is you need to look into yourself. You need to just stop the noise and for at least an hour a day, turn everything off. Um, whether it's just taking a nap, whether it's, um, reading a book. Whether, you know, you're having to read this, you know, a couple chapters of this book and everything too for this time and any of that kind of stuff, but just getting away from that phone, getting away from that, because I think we rely on them way too much. True. <laughs> yeah. And um, <laughs> getting away from that uh, every single day, at least for you know, some amount of time, has really helped. 
and it, it, it helps me actually focus a lot more on the other things um, that I need to be doing. So Good. Good habit. You mentioned books. Mm -hmm. Great segue again, because on the Amount Experience podcast, we are great. We're voracious readers. Excellent. If there's one, two or three books that you feel people should stop what they're doing right now and start to read them, what books would you recommend? There, I mean, there's a lot. I love reading and everything, too, and um, different types of things, and everything too. But, um, you know, for let's say for the entrepreneur, the business person, I mean, obviously, if you haven't read um, Think and Grow Rich, you know, by Napoleon Hill, you got to read that and everything, too. It's, it's great. Um, I think Mark Mason's uh, The Subtle Art of, Don't Get, uh, of Not Giving a Fuck is yeah, an amazing yeah, book. Good book. And that's another good one because it, it makes you kind of change your mindset mm -hmm. and look at things a lot differently. Um, I'd say those are the two, like, you know, I mean, there's uh, The Art of Saying No. Um, I can't remember, Zach. I can't remember the last person last name, but yeah. We'll look it up. One or yeah. two. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the entrepreneur side. Right. But... On the creative side, mm -hmm. Aaron, too, um, my favorite, and, and I like to call him an author, but he's a storyteller, is Neil Gaiman. Yes. He's an unbelievable storyteller. Um, I've loved him, you know, ever since. I'm, I'm a huge comic book geek, Aaron, too. So I've loved him since um, Sandman, Aaron, yes. too, and, you know, all of his books. And But if you can choose one of his, there's one called Ocean at the End of the Lane. Okay. And it is probably one of the best books I've ever read. Nice. Best stories. I won't say books. I will say stories because he is a storyteller. And it is just an unbelievable story. And I've uh, read it a couple different times. Um, we've seen him live. And actually, he, he, he said that, um, even how the audible, just because so, he reads it to you. Nice. <laughs> That's so, even better. It is. Yeah. He's got an amazing voice. He and does. He sounds like a storyteller when he does it. So um, that one and uh, him, I mean, other than that, I mean, like I said, I'm a huge comic book geek, huge Batman fan. Okay. I mean, too. So, I mean, um, you know, if you want to actually um, look at the world that we live in and put a superhero spin on it to an actual real one is um, there's a Batman uh, graphic novel. I actually made a book out of it too called the ultimate evil. And it's about um, child trafficking. Okay. And I mean too, it's, it's an amazing story and it really takes a real serious issue and, but uh, it puts obviously Batman in the world, but it, 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 the whole thing about it is that one man can't stop it. And he basically shows you why, and, and but it makes you kind of think about it. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a really interesting story. Cool. You mentioned Neil Gaiman. I just listened to an interview or a talk he had with uh, Elizabeth Gilbert when he was giving advice to a fledgling author. And so he was tremendous. The advice yeah. he gave, he was good. Like, it was amazing. So I, I understand where you're coming from yeah, with that. Yeah, even, even his wife um, wrote a book called The Art of Asking. Okay. And I, mean, I, have, I, I have it. I haven't finished it yet or anything, okay. too, but it's, so far it's wonderful. Nice. So I know you also do a little work with like nutrition mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, what to eat. I'm curious to know your thoughts. What are your thoughts on like intermittent fasting? Oh, uh, you know, and I, and I, I, I am a fan of intermittent fasting. Okay. I, I have done it multiple times and I, I go back and forth between doing that and everything too, but you got to be able to do it right. The problem with a lot of people have with intermittent fasting is, um, they don't eat throughout the day or things or stuff like that. And then they eat a huge amount of crap at the end of the day. Well, that doesn't actually help. <laughs> you still got to eat good, real food. Right. And everything too. But, um, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. You know, it's, it's all about caloric value, what you're putting in your system. Right. It doesn't matter when you're putting it in. It doesn't matter what it's, what you're putting in your body, how much. That's it. So intermittent fasting is great and everything too, especially if you have a busy schedule, you know, because you, you know, you, you're going to be like, yeah, you're still drinking a lot of water and, and right. things, but it's okay because then, you know, even myself, I still mostly do that. I mean, I have, you know, meals, but my major meal at the end of the day is at the end of the day, you know, is, and, and, and people are like, well, you can't eat after this amount of time. Well, that's, that's no, that's incorrect. 100%. <laughs> um, your body does not understand time. <laughs> You know, so I mean, I didn't, my most of my meals that are my biggest ones are like 10 p.m. at night. Wow. Okay. You know, because I don't get out of here until then. That's when I have dinner. Right. And you know, that's my biggest meal and everything too. So, um, I I believe in it, and I know a lot of people that do. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of noise out there. Is it good? Is it bad? And everything too. Personal experience, I think I I like it. But yeah. again, you know, it, you got to be able to do it right. Don't starve yourself and then gorge at the end right. of the day or anything yeah. too is, and, and even doing that, having little things here and there is fine. Good. I'm a fan of it as well. Now, as a former MMA fighter, I'm always curious to see when you were growing up, were you always attracted to martial arts wrestling? Did you, were you ever a fan of boxing? 
Oh yeah. Oh, one hundred percent. Okay. Um, and I've done a couple boxing fights as well, and we teach boxing. Um, we didn't have boxing in our own town, but my actual um, my mom's uncle was Custom Auto. Wow. So um, Mike Tyson. He, yeah, wow. Huge, huge boxing family number two, but we didn't have it. So right. I loved watching it. Oh, I, I a huge Mike Tyson fan. Okay. Obviously number two, but I mean, I, I, I loved it. Um, and I still watch it today when I can. Um, it's too overpriced for a lot of things, but <laughs> yeah, you know. But uh, I still love it, Nary too, and 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 uh, the sweet science of it, Nary too. Uh, I do love it, but I uh, I actually um, boxing and wrestling were the two things I loved the most. Interesting. And I mean pro wrestling, okay. you know, WWF D- back WF, then, Nary yes. too. That's uh, that's other things. What I I you know, as you're a kid, and I was a kid in the eighties. <laughs> um, boxing and, and and wrestling was big. I mean, martial arts didn't really come up till later. Right in there and stuff too. So those are the two huge things that, um, okay. like we're, we're big into until, you know, this fighting wasn't a big thing until uh, mid nineties. Yeah. So with the emergence of MMA, mm-hmm. what do you think is going to happen with like boxing? Is it going to come back? Cause it's kind of fading away. It's really lost its popularity. And so what, what are your thoughts on the whole industry? I, I think, I mean, as an industry, I mean, people say because of MMA and everything too, I, I mean, I think, uh, combat sports as an industry, cause you got to put it in combat sports, MMA, kickboxing, Muay Thai, boxing, they're all combat sports as an industry. It's, it's up and down. It's actually, I'd say for the most part, overall it's down. And the biggest reason is stars. Uh, yeah. You yeah. know, you got to think about that is People, the people who are the hardcore fans that love the actual martial arts or the the boxing or the actual fighting, they're gonna watch no matter what. But to get the more people, you gotta have stars. stars yeah. And, they, I mean, and that's a big thing is we don't have a lot of stars. Yeah. In there, and and I'm not a huge fan of a hole stars or things like that. <laughs> but you still gotta have a star in there. You gotta have the person that kind of you know rise up like like the Mike Tyson back right. in the day. You know, he wasn't known as an a-hole back then or anything, too. He wasn't, you know, he was, uh, you know, just a kid that's this monster punch, destroy everybody. And that and it made him a star. Yeah, quickly. Yeah, very yeah. quickly. He got put on the main stage and, and proved it, yeah. you know. Um, and, you know, love him or hate him, Floyd Merriweather was that for a long time. I'd say more people now obviously right. don't <laughs> like him. Um, you know, and... and it's, it's hard to be a star, a true star in today's world because of social media, because of things, because of just so many antics that happen and are, and are put in. Yeah. You know, people even like like John Jones, he was probably an MMA star, I mean, too, but then all the everything else happened in his life, and so right. he's not. It kind of dropped down. You know, um, people love Conor McGregor and everything, too. He's on that. Well, he's not really fighting right now. I don't see him doing it in the future after getting $100 million <laughs> fighting Floyd Merriweather. There's right. no reason for him to. <laughs> Um, so we don't really have any stars. Okay. Yeah. If we could think back to your childhood or what, like it can be as an adult, what are, if you could pick one boxing match, that's like the favorite one, the one that's most memorable that you witnessed, what would you pick? Like for me, I remember the first four rounds, I think it was Hagler Spinks, like four or five rounds. Woo. That was like amazing. That's That's one that comes to mind. Oh my God. I'm trying to think. (laughs) I mean, um, it's weird because I mean we we watched it, but I mean we didn't even get a lot of boxing up there, mm-hmm. and everything too. So a lot of it was just on old like things I could see or on the news reels. Yeah. Didn't even ESPN watch classics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and you know um, I'm trying to think. I mean it's it's weird to think about. I mean like Mike Tyson. Um, I'm trying to remember. The, uh, probably it's weird to say it's the one he lost, but probably Mike Tyson Buster Douglas is the first oh, one yeah. that stuck out. Because I loved him so much. And then out of nowhere, boom, you're, it's like your hero all of a sudden loses. Done. And what it changed in me was that they're real people. He's not a superhero. Yeah. You know, um, I, you know, love that fight or hate that fight. It doesn't matter what happened behind that. But it, it definitely changed something in me. And, and it was one of the first ones I watched live. Oh, okay. As yeah. well. Yeah. You know, so, and it was all of a sudden, you know, I was huge Mike Tyson man, right, too. And then all of a sudden, your, your hero loses. And you're like, yeah. I don't of, understand this. Out of nowhere. Yeah, out of nowhere. <laughs> Against a person that you're like, who? <laughs> Buster, who? <laughs> who? Exactly. Yeah. Good thing about sports, though. It's very unpredictable. It is. Tell people how they can find you online. So you can find me on um, social media platforms, either, um, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, 
Um, Instagram, usually it's under Brood9, uh, B-R-O-D, and the number nine um, on a lot of the ones. Uh, myself, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I, I do have Facebook. I honestly don't check that one anywhere near as much as we have the actual Brood9 one up. So right, usually right. it's all throughout there. Cool. Um, even our website, Brood9.com. Um, and that kind of, uh, you know, shows a lot about what we do here, including our new kids program and everything too. So you, you want to share anything about the kids program? Um, sure. Yeah. We, uh, we I took a long time kind of building one up and, um, it's just starting now as a new kids program. It's kids MMA, but it's all about anti-bullying. It's about oh, jujitsu. It's about boxing and, and, and self-confidence and self importance in them and how, uh, you know, self-defense can lead to so many other things. You know, um, I remember even as, you know, looking up a lot of research and I mean, too, obviously people in martial arts and even wrestling have become um, bigger executives than people who were not. Even, even more creative people have become bigger ones than, than people who just stuck to stri uh, strict books and, you know, got like the 4.0s all the time and everything too. But the people who actually focused on ways to make themselves better in other ways, creatively, um, physically, and everything too, have been um, bigger on those aspects, in the, even in the corporate world. Nice. All right, well, you know, definitely want to uh, say thank you for being on the show. I really um, appreciate your insight. I really respect the grind and kind of your path, how you've come from working corporate and starting at the same time. So definitely respect your work. Keep it up. Thank you. Glad to have met you. And then we usually let our guests leave the show with any last minute words of wisdom or advice for people. So I just say thank you and we'll definitely keep in touch and take us home. Um, great. Thank you so much. I mean, I love uh, being here, being able to meet you. Uh, it's been an honor doing it. And you know, uh, words of wisdom, I mean, there's there's so many, but, you know, keep keep at it. Look at what you want to be doing, where you want to be at, and know that you can get there. You know, no one, uh, you know, you may say, oh, people don't believe in me. Uh, there's always people that believe in you. People want you to succeed more than you believe they do. People want you to, you know, uh, when you go into something, when you go into an interview, honestly, they want you to succeed. They want you to get that job because they don't want to keep interviewing people. <laughs> when you go into an audition, they want you to be the one. Believe in yourself. They believe in you, what you're doing. And, you know, if I can say anything, that's it is keep up that. Know you can do it. Know people want you to succeed. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank All right. you. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Amani Experience Podcast. You can check out the show notes on amaniexperience.com slash podcast. Please remember to leave us a review on the platform you are listening on and share this podcast with anyone who you feel would benefit from listening. See you soon on our next episode.